Good morning. Welcome to Grace Christian Center. Um, we will be in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. The message this morning is, do you wish to get well? Do you wish to get well? That's what the sermon is entitled this morning. Do you wish to get well? And that title alone, we can go in so many different directions. Do you wish to get well? When you ask somebody that, you pretty much better know or have to know that there is something wrong with that person. If somebody comes up to you off the street and says, do you wish to get well? What would be your first, you know, feeling? I don't know you. You don't know me. Or, or maybe it's somebody that you do know. What, what would you say to that person? Well, what are you talking about? Or would you just outright say, yeah, I sure would. I sure would, you know. Do you wish to get well? There was a man that sat for 38 years, approximately he was sick, and he sat at a pool. Bethesda was the name of the pool. And people would go in there to get healed, to be touched by the power of God, but he could never make it there in time because he was a paralyzed man. He, he, he didn't have use of his legs or whatever it may have been. We're not too sure. But I want to pick up in, in Scripture here where Jesus encounters a man in John chapter 5, verse 2. It says, Now there is, is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. And these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, him Sir, I have no one, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet or your mat. And walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because He was doing these things on the Sabbath. But He answered them, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. Jesus is still working. But there is much to be said in this story. There was a man who was sick. He knew he wanted healing. He knew he needed healing. And there's many of us, and you listening by video, there's some of you that are, are sick, physically or spiritually sick this morning. And you're at a loss. You're confused. You don't know what you need to do. You don't know what you should do. You're, you're at a loss. You've hit rock bottom. And sometimes that's the only way you can meet God is when you hit rock bottom. Because it says that now God, the supernatural God of heaven and earth, can take over and bring glory to His name. I've been there. Some of you have been there. Some of you are, are still needing to be there. But that's a, that, that's a really hard place to be, rock bottom. That's a really hard place to be, rock bottom. There was an angel, the Bible says, that would come and stir. Every now and then, the angel would come and stir the waters in the pool. And every now and then, 
there would be a healing. And every now and then, there would be a supernatural healing. And every now and then, the people there, they knew, oh, the moving of God, the moving of God. So they would run into this place and they would want to just, you know, be touched by the moving of God. When Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, people just were touching the hem of his garment and they knew that there was healing power in that. These people were some of the most poorest people on the history of the face of the earth at that time. But they knew God. Some of these people recognized the power of God when they saw it with their own eyes. It's a far cry from today. How today, you you have got to be, uh, I'm sorry, but you have got to be an idiot to live in this world and say there is no God. There is order in everything and the way this universe is created and the way our body, our DNA works. There is, it's a complex order. And God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. You can't get this cell phone and throw it on the ground and expect it to become a radio. That's the Big Bang Theory. God is a God of, of order and God is a God of, 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 of creation. And These people have been maimed and paralyzed and hurt. And these people were needing a touch from the Creator. And every now and then they saw the stirring of God. And they wanted to be touched by God. And they would go to this pool and some could get in and some couldn't. By the time the moving of God was over and they got to the pool and I'm like, oh, maybe next time. It's kind of like today. There's movings of God in churches. There are some churches that are moving with the power of the Holy Spirit. And there are some churches that are just dead and dry. God is a gentleman. He will never force Himself upon your life or upon a church. We have to be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to be open to God Almighty. And when you're open, when you come to God with a sincere heart, when you don't have no lying or cursing or deceit in your heart or in your mind, but when you're honest with God, and you cannot fool God, but when you're honest with God, He will move in your life. Until then, He will not move. He is a gentleman. He is not a master of puppets. These people, they wanted to be healed. And this man saw, caught the glimpse of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And Jesus came to this man. And the first thing Jesus said to this man was, Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Do you wish to get well? I mean, I think Jesus knew the answer. I believe He knew the answer. But you see, sometimes, he, maybe all the time, He asked us that kind of question because we don't even know ourselves what we want. Maybe because He had been sick for so long, people were giving Him money, He thought, well, maybe this is a way to have an income. Kind of like people today in American society who, who live off the government. They don't want to go get a job. They don't want to go and, and do and all that God has called them to do because they know somebody will just give them a handout. Now, I'm not against all government programs. You know, the church really is responsible for that. But the church has failed America. Therefore, the government is now having to take care of the poor and the widowless, the widow and the homeless. And the church has got to do some work to do, man, in this church in America today. But get back to my point. This man thought, maybe this is an income for me. Maybe, you know, I, I don't really... He, you know, he had been sick for so long. Guess what? He said he just lost all hope of getting well. And some of you have been sick for so long, you just lost all hope of getting well. You just can't trust God anymore. Your faith is shaken. You're like, well, you know, I, I, just, I guess God just wants me to be like this. Or I guess God just don't love me. Or maybe the, the eyes of the Lord are looking on somebody else and not me. Scripture says Jesus saw him. Jesus sees you. Jesus knows you. Jesus loves you. And he is real. And he is alive. And he is on his throne. And he looked. Do you wish to get it? Well, he asked his man. And the man didn't say yes or no. What did this man say? He said, He started crying. He started saying, Well, you know, I want to. But, you know, people beat me. And it's kind of like somebody telling me, you know, I have these problems. I, I need, I want, I want a touch of God. I want to be healed. But yet, they won't even step foot in the church. They won't even come into counseling. They won't even go, uh, enter into a prayer life with God. Get into the Word of God. It's the same story. It's the same kind of thing. You want to be blessed by God. You want to be healed from your situations. But yet, you don't want to do the things that can bring forth the blessing in your life. 
And that's why Jesus asked him, do you wish to get well? He had been used to being defeated. And some people are used to being defeated. They have a loser mentality. And I want you to look to the person next to you. And say, you are God's choice creation. You are. Because you're made in the image of God. But yet, here's the thing guys, when we look at each other and we hurt each other and we curse each other and when we abuse one another, we're really doing that unto the Lord. Every single one of you, and you listening by video, you are God's choice creation. You're God's choice masterpiece. Of all the creation, you are are, are the, the number one thing that God created where He said, this is perfect. This is just like me. Wow. But yet we live in this world, Christian. Even unbelievers, they live in this world with a defeated mentality, with with their mind in the gutter. And God is saying, there is so much more for you. There is so much more for you. Jesus died on the cross, but they couldn't hold him down because his love for you was stronger than death. He rose himself from the dead. He had the power to lay his life down and he had the power to raise his life up. And if he could do that unto himself, he can do that unto you. And he he said, get in there. The man, he just, he said, get up, pick up your mat, start walking. You know, the man didn't even have to get in the water. The healing power was not in the water. The healing power is not in the laying hands on the preacher. The healing power is not in, in man. Church, get your eyes off pastors. Get your eyes off evangelists. Get your heart on Jesus. The, 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 the healing was in the water, everybody thought. Jesus just told him, just get up and start walking. Jesus said, your eyes are on me, son. Your faith is on me. You're hearing the voice of God. The Bible says, they who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When you hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church, you're going to have healing. You're going to live in victory. You're not going to live in defeat. You've got to stop believing the lies of the devil. You gotta stop listening to the voices around you that don't know Jesus Christ because they cannot give you life because they don't have life. You gotta get yourself around some Bible believing people. That's the only way God loves people through His people. And this was the man of God. This was the Son of God. He went down and He loved this man. This was an example for the church to follow. But at the same time, we have some religious people who will try and put down the miracles of Christ. We've had religious denominations pop up over the past couple thousand years and they've tried to deny the real, true Jesus Christ. These Pharisees, when they saw this man being healed, they looked at him and they said, well, who told you to get up and pick up your mat and walk? Who said you can be healed on the Sabbath? Because the law of Moses says you cannot pick up your anything. You can't do any kind of work. And Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath for a reason. Jesus wanted to come and show, I am fulfilling the law. I am fulfilling the law of Moses. The law was given to convict us of sin. But Jesus came to fulfill sin, fulfill the law and to bring us into eternal life. Jesus said, I am greater than the Sabbath. I am greater than all things. And these Pharisees, they wanted to hinder the, the miracles and the healing power of Jesus. That's just like we have today, church. We have, we have people who are out there building their own ministries up. They're, they want their agenda is to get that fancy jet and that big congregation when they could care less about the very lives of God's sheep. And not only leave it in the pastor's hands, but you look at yourselves. Christian, I speak to the Christian. Look at your own very lives. Look at the people that have been entrusted. Their lives are entrusted to you. Are you honoring them by living an honorable life that honors Christ? You know, we can't bring forth healing in the lives of people unless, if we're not heart is not right with God. We cannot tell people where heaven is if we ourselves ain't on the way to heaven. We need to get sincere in our walk with Christ. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Ask and you shall receive. But again, the religious Pharisees were there. And they were wanting to attack. Jesus said, my father is working until now and I myself am working. I'm working. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. Jesus had just fed a multitude. He fed 5,000 people. These people ate These people were fed. 
he, he, he multiplied the bread and the fish. And if somebody could, if you can lower that AC down just one degree, please. It's getting a little warm in here. Thank you, Eric. He fed the people. He taught the people in the previous scriptures before we're about to read in verse 22. Jesus gave these people a lesson, guys. And now, all of a sudden, he's ready to speak to the disciples. He wants to give the disciples a life lesson that they'll never forget. That they'll never forget. It goes on to say here, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. It says, immediately, he made disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. He had told his disciples, get in a boat, start going. And he went up to go pray. And he wanted the disciples to get into a situation where they would have to call out to him. And sometimes God allows you to get into some situations, into some storms of life, so that you could see the glory of God. You know, this, this man who was sick at the pool, had he not been sick, he wouldn't have seen the glory of God. And sometimes you go through trials and tribulations of your own ignorance, but sometimes you go through trials and tribulations because God's wanting to bring you a life lesson. Now, these disciples were in the boat. They were professional fishermen. They knew how to handle themselves on the ocean. They were professionals. Many of them were professional fishermen. But Jesus went up to pray. And Jesus was praying for their faith, I believe, because Jesus knew what they were about to encounter. It says in verse 24, But the boat was already a long distance from the land, and being battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and he took hold of him. And he said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, you are certainly God's son. There's a life lesson in this, not only for us today, but there's a life lesson for these men that they experienced. They saw a ghost, they thought. And so they thought, is this, is this Jesus? Who is this? They, they, you know, sometimes, guys, when you encounter the living God, sometimes you may be filled with fear. Sometimes the enemy will try and throw you into confusion. Why? 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 Because sometimes when you're about to see the glory of God, there are many powers in the heavenly realms at work. Did you ever think that Satan may have been in that boat also? The uh, demonic spirits were around these men. They were trying to put fear into these men. They knew Jesus. They'd been walking with Him for quite some time. They were in a position where now their master was not there in their presence, physically. And they were getting rocked and back, back by the waves. You know, kind of like the storms of life. When, when the storms of life hit you, and you're getting rocked back and forth, and you just don't know what to do. That's what these men were in. Jesus was teaching them how to become victorious in these kinds of times, and how to do this living in the supernatural realm. There are two kinds of realms that exist. The realm that you and I see. The physical realm. And then there's another realm that exists altogether more. It's the heavenly realms. It's the unseen. It's the unseen. It's where angels and demonic spirits are at battle for your very souls. Now I'm not going to get into this theology about this. This is a whole other sermon. But I believe this battle was taking place in their hearts. This battle was taking place in this very boat. This battle is taking place right now in your life. There are voices calling out to you to go this way and to go that way. 
There's only one voice you need to know. There's only one person you need to recognize. And that's Christ Himself. Amen. These men looked. Peter said to Him, Lord, if it is You, command me to come to You on the water. That statement is ridiculous. Lord, if it is You. You know, He... And somebody may disagree with me, but, but please hear me out. Peter did not have faith to get out of the boat. Because he said, if it is you. Somebody can disagree with me. We're, we can agree to disagree. But he did not have the faith to get out of the boat. Lord, if it is you, command me. You got to know. You got to know. You got to know that you got to know what Jesus is doing in your life. You got to know. Lord, if it is you. He, and that, in no faith, man, he got out anyways because Christ commanded him. Now hear me on this. Even in your unfaithfulness, Christ can command you. And you must obey. Now, I'm not going to get caught up in all kinds of theology about this. But the Bible says that only God can draw men unto the Son. Only God can draw people to the cross. Even in your disobedience of not honoring God, you're still going to the cross. And one day you're going to wake up and find yourself having an encounter with the living God. Even in your, rebe- even in your drunkenness, even in your, in, your, in your perverted mind, even in the sinful lifestyles that some of you have lived or are living even right now. I'm speaking to you by way of video. None of y'all, don't get mad at me, okay? But, but some of y'all, in y'all's disobedience, rejecting God, when the Lord draws you and commands you, you must hear the word of, you must, you must do what God has called you to do. And so even in Peter's unfaithfulness, lack of faith, God commanded him. If Jesus had said, well, if you think it's me, come. If you think it's me. Jesus would, I mean, Peter would have stayed in that boat. But he got out of the boat. And as soon as he got out, he began to look to the left and to the right. He began to see the waves. Now, what are the waves? The waves are the enemies in your life. And we're not talking about flesh and blood. We're not talking about your spouse, your kids, your in-laws. We're not a battle with flesh and blood, but with what? Powers of what? Darkness in the unseen realms. He began to have those spiritual attacks. Those mountains, those waves he was looking at and he was like, he was doubting. He was already had doubt in his, in his heart when he got out of the boat. The only reason why he got out is because Christ commanded him to get out. A mountain cannot be moved, but Christ said, I can command that mountain to go into the ocean. Amen? If a volcano could do it, how much more could Christ put a mountain into the ocean? When Christ says to do something, it's got to be done. But this man got out and he started looking at his situation and he started sinking and you know he was walking and he was walking in the supernatural realm. And I believe as a Christian, in this very day that we're in, even now more than ever before in the history of, of the church, we have to be a people that live in the supernatural realm. We have to be. And that's only going to come by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's only going to come with a sincere heart to God. You're only going to live in a victory, Christian, when you have given your entire heart and mind to Jesus Christ. When you do that, you will live in the supernatural. You'll walk on water. Some of you say, well, let me test God and go to Galveston and walk on the, on the bay. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is... you. The, let me take this to you real quickly. This is not in the PowerPoint, but I need to read this to you. It's in Mark, the very last chapter in Mark. I believe it's in Mark chapter 16. Jesus says to them, Go into all the world, Mark sixteen fifteen. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Amen? That's where a lot of Christians end their life. They believe, they're baptized, and they're saved, and they don't want to do anything else. They got fire insurance. They're sitting on the pews. But see, God, Christ goes on, though. He goes on to say, 
And you see, there's a semicolon there. They shall be saved. Pause. See, because God is speaking to us through the living word. Some people just stop there in their Christian walk. Oh, I'm saved. I go to church. I do my thing. I praise the Lord, worship the Lord. But you don't want to go any further with God. You don't want to get out of the boat. He goes on to say here, In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And they will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick. And they will recover. What does this mean? It's saying that the supernatural will happen in the life of a Christian. Cast out demons? Demons are real, my friend. Our battle, Paul warns us that our battle is specifically with them. We need to stop fighting amongst each other. The Bible says love covers over a multitude of sin. You can hinder the work of God in your life by fighting amongst each other. I don't care who's done evil against you. If you call yourself a Christian, if you say you have the love of God in you, you have the love to cover over a multitude of sin that people do against you. And if you don't allow that to happen and take place and let the love cover over their evil that they've done to you, then you shortchange yourself and you quench the Spirit of God. Stop it. Stop it. Love. Love. Love people to the cross just as you were loved to the cross. You will speak in new tongues. Yes, I believe in the speaking of tongues. Heavenly language, other earthly languages. But it's also going to a deeper meaning where you will learn a new way of living too. You you will learn not only to speak in in heavenly languages or other languages to testify the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you will speak in a new language. You will learn a new way of living in God's kingdom. And it goes on to say you will pick up snakes. We had some some Christian, uh, certain denominations out there that pick up snakes, snake handlers, pastors, and they think this is what that means. My friend, that is not what this means. It goes back to what I said. Those disciples were in the boat and there was demonic spirits attacking them, trying to put fear into their heart. Because whenever a storm is coming against you, there you're in the midst of evil. But greater is the light within you than the darkness around you. Now, it goes on to say here, you will pick up serpents with your hands and they will not hurt you. Does that mean you can pick up snakes? No, that's not what it means. Here's what this means. Satan is described as a what? Serpent. Now, when Satan came into the Garden of Eden, what was he manifested as? A serpent. What this means, I believe, and this is my opinion, is that when you, Christian, you have the ability, Christian, to deal with the very kingdom of Satan with your bare hands and cast him down. Only the Christian. No other religion. No other faith. Only the true follower of Jesus Christ can actually deal with the kingdom of Satan and every demonic spirit with their hands only through the name of Jesus and only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you don't go looking for these fights but if they come your way you have a promise from Jesus himself that you can deal with these enemies. You can deal with these enemies if your children have got caught up in something horrible. You can go and lay hands on them. You can cast demons out. You can, by by living a life that honors God, you can instill faith into the hearts of your children. And you can take the kingdom of Satan that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And you can cast it down so that Jesus can come and have, we can have life abundantly. You can deal with the kingdom of Satan. You can deal with the problems that you're going through in life. That's a promise of Jesus. Don't ever, Christian, wake up in the morning, and I mean ever, wake up in the morning and say, oh man, I'm just depressed, I'm sad. If you do that, shame on you. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that God can help you overcome. Look at the cross. That was the ultimate. Jesus said, it is finished, it is accomplished. There is nothing that we've gone through or we will about to go through that Jesus cannot help us overcome. 
It is time for the Christian. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm sorry, but, but you need to bear with me in my heart in this. But you've got to come, there's got to come a point in time in a Christian's life where you have to say, quit being a baby. Grow up. Do and be who you were called to be. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? It means you've got to make up your mind what you're going to do. I say it all the time in this church. You pick what kind of cereal you're going to eat. What kind of car you're going to drive. What kind of job you're going to work at. Who you're going to marry. Who you're not going to marry. You make all these kinds of decisions up. You need to make your mind up about Jesus Christ. I don't care what I'm going through. I don't care what kind of sickness is in for me. I am going to serve the living God. And I am going to continue to walk on water. Because my Lord said I can. And it's not about going to Ron Carter and laying your hands on a Hummer or Lexus or whatever it is. That's not the power of God. It's not, I don't believe in that. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. But that's not what the Christian life is all about. It's about having a love, a joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life. Having victory over Satan and his demonic legions. That's what the Christian life is all about. All for the glory of God. I see far too many Christians in this church also. Far too many Christians who will walk around and, and they're thinking they're at fight with me or with somebody else when their fight is with, with Satan, not me. Their problem is with, with, with God. They've got an issue and you know, you, we've got to take our eyes off of each other. When we all get to the, the, the heaven as Christians, God's going to deal with every single one of us. And we cannot, be to make, we cannot play God on this earth. You need, to, you need to forgive. You need to let things go. Far too many Christians are getting swallowed up by unforgiveness. When you live that way, you cannot live in the supernatural realm. You cannot walk in water. Your prayer life is hindered. Your, your, your Christian serving others, your, your Christian life of being a servant is, is hindered. You can't, you're not effective in the church. You're useless because it's all about you and not about Christ, not about others. Peter couldn't walk on that water. He started sinking because he was thinking about him. He, he, he didn't say, can my brothers and I walk on the water? He said, can I walk on the water? It was a selfish mentality. And when you're stuck on I, you're stuck in idolatry. We live and function in the supernatural realm for the sake of others. To bless others. For giving glory to God. Not to say, ooh, look at me. Shame on that person. But God wants to bless you so that you would live in the supernatural realm and bring glory to God and bring souls into heaven. They said, this is the Son of God. In John chapter four, 11, my last scripture, Matthew chapter 11, I'm sorry. Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Now, now let's look at the key words here. Come. Weary. Heavy laden. Give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn. Gentle. Humble. Heart. I mean that these words are beautiful. The Lord is saying in a sense. I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling. Come to me. And you will be restored. You will be made new. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men throughout the past 2,000 years of the church have really messed up things. And have really confused people out there who are hungry for God. But that does not give mankind an excuse to miss God. God is speaking to your heart today. If you're tired, you need to come to Jesus and you need to stay at Jesus' feet till the very last of your breath 
And I promise you, one day, every one of you will breathe your last breath on this earth. For some, you may die tonight. We heard of a young teenager that just dropped dead last week. Just dropped dead. You're not too young to die. You're not too old to die. Death is a respecter of no persons. I knew of a woman who had picked up her two kids from high school. And she was driving down Highway 6 in Manville. And a man just hit her head on. Killed her. Are we ready for Jesus? Jesus says no one, no man, no woman comes to the Father, comes to heaven except through me. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Now for some of you, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you listening by the video, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But, here's the thing. Have you continued to allow to surrender to Christ in your Christian walk? The burdens that you tend to want to naturally carry on your own. You need to surrender them to Christ. It's evident on some of the faces. We're trying to hold on to things. We're trying to be God. We're trying to, you know, we're looking at the, at the failures of people. People who have failed us. We hold on to those things and we need to let go. Let God be God. So that we can live in a supernatural realm. The message is, do you wish to be healed? Do you want to get well? And there's a lot of things that can make the Christian sick. But you've got to ask yourself, do I want to get well? And you've got to say, yes, I do. And it begins with a surrendering to Christ. It begins with a surrendering to Christ. But never forget what Christ has done for you. Church, we're about to go into some of the darkest days in the history of the United States. I've said it again and again and again and I'll say it again because I know we're very imminent to that point where this Bible will be outlawed in the United States of America. Every Bible-believing preacher will be put into jail because every Bible-believing preacher will not be silent in their testimony of Christ. And the, the Constitution, your rights, will be ripped from you. We will see this. You will see this happen. That is a revelation by the Holy Spirit. This will come to pass in your lifetime. We need to lay all our burdens and cares upon the Lord. And just live. Just live. Just live. Just trust what Jesus is doing in your life. Look at the, the lives of your family and your children. They're worth it. They're worth it. The sacrifice is worth it. Do you wish to get well? 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 And admitting that, that says that you have something wrong with you. And only the Lord can heal you. So we're in a good place today. Amen? I'm not the healer. I'm not, I can't get no magic wand and do something great in your life. Only the Lord can. Only the Lord can. Every eye closed in this place. Father.